Okay. So, um, first of all, thanks to everyone who's here. I'm excited to be talking with you today about designing and building great web APIs. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is me. This is how you find me on Twitter and GitHub and LinkedIn and uh, all sorts of other platforms. I'd love to connect with you, hear more from you and what you're working on. So please uh, feel free to uh, connect with me. If you connect with me in LinkedIn, please remind me that it's that we're meeting through the interface event and I'll be sure to recognize you. So the material for this session is actually based on this book that is going to be released in July, Design and Build Great Web APIs with Pragmatic Publishing. And it's really a collection of all the things I've learned over the years from many, many people. And um, I'm going to try to just give you uh, a little sense of what that's like uh, today, give you a, a sense of what's in the book. It's just sort of a high level view, but if you're interested, you can find more there. So what I really wanna talk about are these ideas of foundations for building great web APIs. What's a great web API? What is the foundational piece? Uh, and the practice of design, build, and release. Design, build, and release. Design, build, and release. That's our sort of cycle of what we're going to do. And I'm going to share with you patterns and practices that I found really common. And then in typical sort of Steve Jobs fashion, there's a little extra thing at the end. All right. So let's get right to the foundations side of things. So foundations are what help us actually put everything together. What is our purpose? What is our reason for doing all these things? So first, the first foundational element uh, I like to talk about is API first. So I learned about this from Cass Thomas in 2009, this idea of, of designing uh, uh, I means identifying key actors and people and what is it they're trying to do with APIs. APIs are here to solve a problem, solve a business problem, to solve a group's problem, to solve an individual's problem. And that's what we really need to do. When you think API first, what you're really thinking about is first, what is the problem and how can I help solve it? Uh, Ken Lane has a great way of thinking about API first as sort of the foundational element or the platform piece that we all start with. I like that too. Um, but I love Cass Thomas's point of view. So we're solving business problems. We're designing APIs for people, not for generics, right? Not for robots, but for people. People need help. If people are writing in C Sharp or PHP or Ruby, these are different people. They, they think of things differently. The API I construct for a JavaScript developer is different than the API I construct for a Rust developer. And that's really important to think about. And that means I need to design for an audience and I will need to do design thinking. I need to plan out what is this person? What is, what is their day like? What do they do every day? What is the challenge that's facing them? And how can I help them? So that's really what API First is about. Um, the other thing that in the foundational element is this notion of uh, HTTP, the web, and REST. This book is unapologetically about HTTP APIs. Now, we've had a lot HTTP APIs for a quarter century. That's a long time. We won't have them forever. We've got lots of other things going on that sort of challenges that HTTP space. But because of the scope of the book, I stuck with HTTP. It's important to think that, remember that HTTP is a protocol. It's a standardized protocol that everybody uses. There's nothing creative here. There's nothing magical going on. It's just how we do things, right? That's how we pass information around. The web is another story. The web is a common set of practices, separation of concerns between the markup and the script and the, and the layout and uh, uh, you know, styling. Uh, the idea of using links to get from A to B, using forms to collect information, to describe what I need to collect, to collect it and pass it on. That's a common practice model. Now, that's, the web is a common practice. It's not a set of standards, but there are lots of interlocking behaviors that go into place. And last is this idea of REST as a style. I'm, I'm very much a REST type person. I really like the notion of REST. It's a 20-year-old uh, dissertation, so there are lots of other things besides REST in the world but I still focus a lot on REST. And REST has this really interesting approach that there are properties of a system that I want, so I'm gonna set up some requirements and some constraints to get those properties. We don't talk about it here today, but there's, there's a, a section in the book that talks about what REST is really about. REST is about eliciting uh, properties from a system that you don't control. How do I get a group of people to act in the same way? How do I herd cats? That's what REST style is about. So um, we really have this idea of solving business problems, solving for people, 
in using this pattern of which protocol I'm using, what practices I'm using, and what style I'm eliciting. You can plug in other things. If I want to use UDP, if I want to use TCP IP, if I want to use WebSockets, that's a protocol. What are the practices I'm going to use? I'm going to use web practices. Am I going to use uh, internal software practices? What is the style I'm going to use? And so on and so forth. All these things come into play. So those are good foundations. Once we have this notion of foundations, what are, my, what are my basic principles? Now we can start thinking about designing and talking about designing in a really uh, coherent kind of way. So I want to talk about designing from three perspectives, modeling, designing, and then describing. So modeling is collecting up all this information so that it makes sense. Designing is actually acting on what you've, you've put together. Describing is documenting it well. So when we model design, what we're really modeling is interactions in life, right? Uh, there's a thing called uh, Donald Norman, Donald Norman's Action Life Cycle. And you can see the illustration here in the slide. So Donald Norman's Action Life Cycle is this notion of we have this world, we have, we have a goal. We want to see what we're trying to do, and we want to execute a plan, specify, perform, see how we change the world, interpret those changes, compare it to our goal, and decide if we need to go again. There are no straight lines. It's a circle. Too many times I see people design software as like we're going to start from A and go to B. That's not how it works. There's lots and lots of circles, attempts. And that means there's an API story. We need to know when we're modeling. We need to end up with something like an API story. Here's an example of a simple API story. What's the purpose of this service or this API? What is the data that we deal with? What are the actions that people want to commit to it? What are some of the internal processing or rules that we have? Purpose, data, action, processing. This is the key to writing a great API story. You don't have to worry about screens. You don't have to worry about things like that. But you need to figure out what are the actions people want to do. We will use this as part of our design process. And usually there are lots and lots of stories that you need to collect up, just like you would in user stories. Designing is another thing. Taking all of that information we've collected about your purpose, your data, your actions, and any internal processing or rules, and now start thinking about your design. We need to think, well, how do people normally do this? How are they doing this in real life today? Do we do skeuomorphic design? In other words, do we just mimic what they do online? Uh, we mimic in person and do it online, or do we completely design it differently? Maybe people need a change in life. Maybe people need it the same. Think about your design. What are the jobs to be done? I need to get certain things done. I need to get this action taken, this action taken, this action taken. Where are the bottlenecks? What am I really trying to do? And then literally diagramming that in some kind of way. Actually create a physical diagram. A lot of people uh, take information in uh, through a diagram much faster than they do in writing. So using a diagram is key. Now you'll see the, the actual illustration here are several steps in this whole design process. I need to get the description, that's the story. I need to create a diagram for people to use. I need to find, uh, write down the definitional details of the actual definition of what I'm gonna do, like the blueprint. And then I actually need to write a document, uh, write documentation that makes it possible for other people to use this in some way. The more complex, the more confusing, um, the more difficult it is to use the object, the more documentation I need to have. Don't wanna write a lot of documentation? Make it super easy to use, right? Okay, so here's an example of a diagram. I use a kind of a weird looking diagram. It's not really quite a, it's not a state diagram. It's not really quite a sequence diagram, but it has this notions of activities I need to do, like list and filter and read and update and delete and connections between the two. I can go from the home uh, uh, action to do a list action. I can do from the list action, the filter action or a read action or maybe a delete action, or maybe a create action, right? So I have all these connections, and I label the connections in between because they'll come in handy later. It doesn't really matter what kind of diagram you use, whether it's UML or any other kind of complex diagram or action diagrams or, or anything. As long as you're consistent and you have a visual diagram that your audience can use. It's really important to diagram what's going on in a way. Notice again in this one, there are no straight lines. I don't go from one step to the other. I actually go from home to list, and then I go from list to a bunch of things, and maybe I go from read to a couple of things. This is really, really important to think about. This is our cycle of execution that we talked about earlier. 
Finally, I need to describe my design, all this model information that I took, I need to describe it in a technology agnostic kind of way. I don't know exactly what people are gonna do with this design when they're done. They may build a uh, open API, uh, they may build a GraphQL API, and they may build an async API, use protobuf, or even a WSDL, or something else like that. I don't know yet, but what I need to do is capture all of that. So I need to capture all the details and properties and actions in a way that's gonna allow someone to then design, build the last, build the design in the way they need. I use a language called ALPS for this, the Application Level Profile Semantics. Uh, this is a version of ALPS uh, that's written in the, um, uh, there, there are very, many sort of XML, JSON, and this is a sort of the YAML version. ALPS are really simple descriptors. We don't need to get too excited about that. You can look in the book and you can look online. Actually, I point out there's a little tool that converts ALPS documents into these other formats. So I can read in ALPS and output an open API, read in ALPS, output a GraphQL uh, uh, setup, a read in ALPS async, protobuf, so on and so forth. So what I wanna do is come up with a machine readable way that lets, uh, that's technology agnostic, and that's what the ALPS document is for. The ALPS is really the robot or the machine version of the story, right? So I wrote down the story, the data, the actions, uh, and all of that stuff. Now I convert it into something a machine reads. That's what this is. So model using your story, design using a diagram, describe using something like ALPS or some other description. Some people skip ALPS and go right to the type, like they'll go to RAML or OpenAPI. Uh, it's fine if you want to do that. But I encourage you to come up with a technology agnostic version that lets you actually launch several different types of designs. So once we're there, now it's time to actually build something. Now it's time to actually put something together. And I would like to talk about sketching, prototyping, and building as the three steps of, of creating uh, APIs, making them real. So I'll talk about sketching from Frank Geary. I actually learned this from Ronnie Mitra. Ronnie's given a talk here uh, at this event as well. Sketching lets you literally write out, let's, let's, what, is the, what does the front end look like? What does the API look like? What does the, what does the exchange look like? What does the query look like? I use apiary blueprint language to do my sketches. So I write up simple sketches, I can press F5, I write them in Markdown, press F5, and I can test them. I can test them with a mock. So I can do sketches in minutes. I don't have to take weeks or days. I can do sketches in minutes. Sketches are meant to be thrown away. I'm just gonna sketch the things that are interesting to me. Prototyping is different. Uh, prototyping is complex, it can be expensive, and needs to be very detailed. I need to explore a lot of details. This is actually the prototype for uh, the Mount Rushmore in the United States. Uh, there's lots of stories about how much Mount Rushmore got built. It's actually a very much a lean story. So if you'd like to learn more about that, I, I encourage you to do that. But I use OpenAPI. Prototypes are, for, uh, are meant to be tested out. So I'll write a rather detailed OpenAPI and use that mock for all those kinds of details. I'll figure out exactly what I need to do, what are the responses, what are the bodies that I need to pass, what are the queries, what are the uh, uh, head, what are the uh, tags, headers, all sorts of things like that. Finally, once I have, I know I've explored options, and I know I've got details, I can actually start building. What you wanna do is you wanna make build of an API boring. I've already done everything. I've already discovered all the details. Build is simply assembly things. Think about a construction site. I don't wanna dig a big hole and order a lot of cement or a lot of girders until I know how this is gonna turn out ahead of time. So I'll use a repeatable process. What I use in the book is a, is, a, is a library system called Dart for isolating the data, the actions, the, the resources, representations, and transitions. We'll talk briefly about that, but again, it doesn't matter if you use some other format. What, what matters is that you can do this consistently and repeatedly. So I describe all of the data that we pass on the interface, any required elements, any enumerated values for data types, any default values for data types. I then actually write the code for the internal actions. This is how you approve payload, update a customer, set the status, uh, so on and so forth. I write that code directly. Then I marry that code and those interface requirements with a set of resource routes. Right, so you can see I'm using uh, I'm using uh, Express here. I think Express is just really easy. It's super easy to use, so I use it. Now I also need to uh, talk about the representations out. So I always convert my internal model into a message model. Message models are the strong typing of the web, whether it's uh, something like 
PAL or Uber or Mason or Collection JSON or Siren and things like that, or HTML or CSS. These are the strong types, not objects. That's not how the web works. They, they work on these representations. And then finally, I add another thing that, that is important to me because I use the REST style. And that is a way to express actions in HTTP language. So this is how you add an account. This is the URL you use. This is the rel tags. This is the title. This is the method. These are the arguments, and so on and so forth. And you can get a lot of things done with that. So sketch to experiment. Toss away the things you don't need. Prototype. Um, so while sketching takes me minutes, maybe prototyping takes me days. Building will take me weeks, right, in some setup. And I want to make sure that what I'm doing in building is translating that design into something that's solid that works in a repeatable kind of way. So let's talk about releasing APIs here. So I put in my book, releasing is testing, security, and deployment. Now in reality, you'll be, remember no straight lines, you'll be actually doing this over and over and over again. You'll be testing every time you save, you'll be working on security all the time, you'll be deploying over and over, maybe every day if you're lucky, right? But here we're gonna talk about them separately. So when I talk about testing, remember we're testing the interface, not the code. We're testing the behavior, the inside out. That's why I like BDD so much, right? Because BDD is, is from the outside in. Be sure to test both happy paths, which you expect to return 200, and sad paths, which return 400. I shouldn't be able to save a record if it's missing a field. I shouldn't be able to write a field with an invalid value. I shouldn't be able to approve this if the record's missing something uh, uh, from some other action. Right, so I got to test both the happy and the sad. I use a thing called simple request testing, which is literally using curl. I write up a bunch of curl messages into a small script, and I can run that in one step just like that. I can run SRTs in milliseconds, right? So very often that's my proof um, for build before I do a build or a check-in. I use Postman and Newman for full-on BDD testing, right? So I use Postman to write my my tests, write my uh, scripts, and I do a thing called um, uh, protocol structure values when I write tests. Test the protocol, did I get a 200 or a 201 that I should have gotten, or did I get something else? And did I get the right media type, the right strong type messaging? Are there other headers that I need to focus on? Uh, then I can do uh, structure. Does it have certain pieces to the puzzle? Does it have a body? Does it have a, a link section? Does it have a data section? So on and so forth. Then I can check the values. Does it have a link that has the value of X? Does it have a name that has a value of X? And so on and so forth. So that's really, really important. I also we talk about some uh, libraries that I use, but we'll talk about those later. From the security side, I keep it real simple in my APIs. I focus on uh, encryption, identity, and access control. Encryption is just basically your HTTPS, your, your TLS system. For uh, uh, identity and access control for machine-to-machine -machine authorization, I use Java Web Tokens, and, um, and I use Auth0 as my provider. So I keep it super simple. It's rather fiddly to do authorization uh, because you really have to get a token ahead of time when you're doing APIs. You can't do it interactively very easily, but get it, get it ahead of time and you'll be fine. That's kind of what this does. So request a token and return a token from the OAuth provider, then I carry that with me. Then I request a resource, I carry that token, that token gets validated by the service, and then I eventually get this thing sent back to me, right? There's more talk about that. Deployment's also a, an interesting challenge. I have organizations that do lots of kinds of deployment, whether it's integration, delivery, or, or just basically continuous deployment. So it's really important to know the difference between the three. Continuous in integration is when I do all my coding, check-in, and testing over and over again, continuously. Uh, continuous delivery is when I can do automatically post something to staging, and then maybe once it's approved, somebody can go ahead and put it in production. Continuous deployment is when I can actually go all the way to production. Remember, automation improves safety. Automation makes things more consistent and makes them safer. I use, uh, in the book, I just use Heroku via Git push. I love Git deploy. Git deploy is a fantastic notion. It it's lowers the, the barrier of entry and repeats so many other things. So I use a little bit of script, and if things fail, then everything gets moved back automatically because that's really what needs to happen. Heroku's really good at doing this. Other organizations are good at doing this as well. I just happen to use Heroku in the book because it's, a, it's an easy start. Okay, so test your interface and behavior using Newman and Postman. Test your security uh, using uh, client credentials with, with tokens and uh, automate your deployment using something like Git push or something else. So we've talked about uh, the key elements 
we have a foundation, we do design, we do build, release. What's the last thing? You're gonna have to modify this API. You're gonna modify it over and over and over. So we need to have some principles. We need to have some ideas about, remember when you write updates, first do no harm. You're not supposed to break anything. You can't break anything. You need to know when to say no. It's, it's too dangerous to make this change or it's okay to do this change. You can fork your API and create a new one if you want. Uh, remember, when you design things, you can't take anything away. You can't change the meanings of things. All you can do is add. Adding is how it works. It's how it works in nature, how it works in any complex system. You need to test all of your new releases using all the old tests. Don't rewrite your tests. You can write more tests, add tests for the new feature. Don't rewrite the old tests. You need those old tests to confirm that your new component still works the way it should. When you release, you need to make sure that you support reversibility or re-entry. In other words, reversible, we can reverse this change, just like Heroku does. That's the first thing you need to do. Second, you need to favor the idea of side-by-side -side releases. I can have edition one and edition two side-by-side -side running at the same time. It doesn't really matter. People can use the one they want. If you do an overriding release, if you actually get rid of the old code or get rid of the old interface and you're gonna use another one instead, make sure it's backwards compatible. Otherwise, you're running a huge risk. In real life, we don't have overriding releases in nature. We just have more divergence, more variance, and some die off eventually. That's the way it really works. And that die off eventually is really important. When it's time to shut your API down, it's going to be at some point it's already solved its problem. Nobody needs it anymore. It's not profitable. It's outdated. Place the code in the public domain so others can still use it. If you can't do that, at least open source the interface. Everyone's been using the interface anyway. Place it in a repository somewhere so somebody can create their own if they still really need the service. Allow people to recover their data if you've been keeping their data. Allow them to have their own data back. And then mark your existing production API 410 gone with a pointer to where the new version is or where the documentation is or where the public domain code is or where the interface is. API shutdown is really important. You're going to do a lot of it. If you create a lot of APIs, you're going to do a lot of shutdowns. So pay attention to this really important element in the story. First, do no harm. No breaking changes. Test using all the old tests. Favor side-by-side -side release. And be responsible when you shut things down. That's a whole other book. That's a whole other process. So foundations, design principles, building principles, releasing patterns, and this idea of updating. That's how you design and build great web APIs. It's a never ending cycle, just like we talked before, because we all we're really doing is identifying what people really want, what they really need, and what they wanna do with their APIs, and that's our job. So hopefully, I know that was a whirlwind, but hopefully that makes some sense. Do we still have some time for a few questions? Yeah, I think, uh, I think okay. you, we have the time for one question that I've been collecting already. And so okay. how, you know, how will you deal with this never ending challenge of uh, the design on one side and then developers opting to write the code first and yeah. they don't want to hear anything about it. Yeah. So the most common, uh, the, the thing I tell people most often is those people who want to write code first, get them on the design process. Don't, 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 I know it's hard, but get them involved earlier. Get them involved in the process. I'm, I'm working with a customer right now that their their, their culture is a real hard, a big challenge with that. But the idea is to is to rather than you know fight that urge, take advantage of that urge. Come into the meeting. Help me write the story. Help me do the sketches. Help me do all of these things on the early side. And then what happens is people will learn from both. It can be a challenge. It's not easy. But then again, you know what? If it was really easy, they wouldn't hire us at all. They just have machines. So get people involved. If people are not comfortable, the best the best idea is to get them to join you. Yeah, sounds reasonable to me. All right, uh, you can give your virtual round of applause to Mike. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for being here with us today.